Welcome back to Grand Theft World Podcast. We're going to go from sport coat and well-lit, Jay, to Hawaiian shirt and questionably lit, Jay. How you doing, Jay? I'm great. Thank you. It's weird watching the old, uh, seems like yesterday, but it was actually four years ago, the old carb-bloated me, the, the puffy carb-bloated version of me. So I think only you here. see that, man. I, don't, I mean, I just saw I saw Jay and I was like, oh, maybe that was six months ago or a year ago. But apparently it was pre-COVID, right? About four years ago. Yeah. Oh, geez. And what you were talking about was so apropos. It was almost prophetic. It did. I, I'd forgotten all everything I said in that video for the most part. Yeah, that's why I thought you'd, you'd like it in context. I just didn't uh, look at the original date to see how long uh, ago it was. All right. So how are you doing, man? How's life treating you? Great. Yeah, everything's great. I'm looking forward to um, expanding into the new topics that I've been covering lately. Uh, actually, our conversation that we did pretty recently about uh, some of the back backdoor espionage secrets of the 20th century kind of prompted me to go down the rabbit hole of looking at the history of the mafia in the 20th century um, and the way that they've had a deep connection to intelligence agencies, the military, um, and uh, so that's been a whole new area of uh, exploration for me and then tying that in as well to serial killers. So we've got new topics that we're uh, looking into on my end and uh, just uh, really enjoying connecting a lot of new dots. And there is some crossover between those two topics. <laughs> Absolutely. Believe it or not, there really is. I mean, one of the crossovers is, in fact, Uncle Sam himself. Uh, right or uncle uh, son of sam if you want to use the yeah. terminology of berkowitz which there is some evidence to suggest that the, perhaps there was another layer of cult involved in the uh, the uh, berkowitz situation if you look at the research of somebody like maury terry for example or dave dave mcgowan yeah there's a lot of that mk ultra stuff that runs parallel to like manson and all these other things and you're right mcgowan was the uh the the person who did the most profound work on that uh the Laurel Canyon series, um, that whole idea of connecting the psychedelics and the military industrial complex and all sorts of other untoward activities that were going on out there, uh, like really, really counterculture, like against our culture. Yeah, exactly. In fact, um, I was really, I've been just surprised even kind of already knowing some of that, uh, diving deeper into that the last month to find so many people that you wouldn't expect were actually known members of MK Ultra. For example, um, one of the famous serial killers who surprise went on to start his own dungeon cult, uh, Gary Heidnick, was a known participant in uh, the MK Ultra experiments. Um, he underwent a profound transformation after his volunteering during his military service um, for those experiments. Um, everybody probably has heard of especially in these circles, right? Uh, Theodore Kaczynski uh, volunteering for being in MKUltra. A lot of people don't know that the mobster himself, Whitey Bulger, famously underwent uh, participation uh, in MKUltra. And uh, it looks like, although I haven't totally confirmed it with uh, Berkowitz, but there is, uh, I have dug up archive news uh, clippings talking about Berkowitz having a, a change of personality when he took LSD during his military experience. So granted, he could have been doing that when he was, you know, off base or whatever, but it's also very plausible that uh, he was, was doing that while he was uh, in his military service. It's the right time frame of when a lot of these guys did have um, specific um, connections to uh, MKUltra and also the, the evidence that relates to the Phoenix program with many of these guys being involved directly in that, um, especially figures like uh, uh, Arthur Shawcross seems to be a pretty clear example of a serial killer who had a Phoenix connection. Um, and then Wayne uh, Williams is a, um, a famous uh, black guy serial killer uh, who claimed to be uh, a, a private contract assassin for the CIA. Um, when we look at uh, entities like Murder, Inc., underneath Albert Anastasia, the famous uh, mob head, he had a guild <laughs> at one time of 100 or 250 uh, contract killers. And many of these contract killers were responsible for multiple murders, some even up to 20. Uh, in the case of the famous uh, FBI informant, Joe Valachi, who flipped and uh, was the first to, uh, informant to really give a lot of information on the workings of the mafia to the FBI. Well, in the case of him, he, you know, he, he had supposedly killed, claimed to kill 20 people. So you can see the clear overlap between uh, intelligence agency contracted assassins, guilds of assassins that the mafia calls on, 
and then people who uh, you know participate in government programs to train them to be killers, such as um, uh, the case of the Phoenix program, uh, as well as this, uh, I had totally forgotten that, and this is in Dave's book to give Dave credit, but I had forgotten about this uh, NATO conference where a Dr. Thomas Narrut back in the early, late 70s, early 80s, I have the news clipping here somewhere, um, uh, he had given this, this speech on the Navy finding and profiling narcissistic psychopaths and killers to participate in their social engineering psychological warfare program. They don't release the details of it, but Professor Nerut assures you, don't worry, we're not training assassins. We're just taking these crazed serial killers and using them for undefined mind control experiences. But I promise you, we're not using them as assassins. Just take my word for it. Uh, so yeah, I mean, in situations like that, when we have like defined you know, evidence of Navy officials admitting this, I mean, there's, there is hard evidence that for that. Um, and, and I don't believe him when he says that they wouldn't create assassins. We know in many cases that they openly have created assassins. So anyway, that's just, I'm, I'm rambling, but you get the point that that's kind of the, the new rabbit hole I've been in for the last month. Camp David, the presidential retreat was an assassination training camp. And so was camp point. X on the Canadian camp border. X, exactly. Yeah. And Ian Fleming and all the Anglo-American X2 and uh, double cross. That guys. doesn't, that doesn't exist, Richard, because yeah. uh, even though there is a program to recruit and profile psycho psychopathic serial killers, uh, it's not to use them as psychopathic serial killers. Yeah, 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 yeah. So they just run assassination camps. And then the next point I was going to add is last night I caught part of Errol Morris's Wormwood about uh, Dr. Frank Olson and the MK Ultra experiments and how the CIA likely pushed him out of a window. And it's a really interesting um, uh, telling of the story. It's interesting. But what I also found interesting is in some of the theatrical presentation of that movie, there's uh, like historical footage in there. And what I saw was I saw the eight ball. So I've been learning about uh, the past couple of weeks, biological warfare and these type of topics were coming up. And then my buddy Tyler had it on his podcast. He had all this historical stuff about uh, germ warfare and these sort of things. So I heard about this big aerosol containment unit. But last night I saw footage of men strapped their faces into it. Like they would be buckling your face up and they're like, we're going to release this thing and see what happens to you. And so to hear about it from the audio book and a podcast was one thing. And then to see that footage in that movie last night, I was like, that's so they do. They train assassins. They test chemical weapons. They do all this stuff, but they wouldn't combine the chocolate with the peanut butter and make the Reese's, even though that's how they overthrow countries around the world and take care of their enemies and this sort of thing. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I never previously put much uh, time into researching the JFK thing, not because I believe the government story. It's just that it wasn't really anything that particularly piqued my interest. But then um, when you get into the relationship between the CIA and the mafia, you will inevitably kind of be forced into looking at uh, the background connection between the way that uh, the CIA, for example, has contracted the mafia to do killings or assassinations at times. In fact, there was multiple uh, famous examples of this with Santos Traficante, the mafia boss of Florida, uh, and his being paid by Robert Mayhew, famous CIA and FBI operative, uh, who paid him under congressional investigation. They, they had figured out that he, was, he, had, been, he had given $150,000 to Traficante and to John Rosselli and uh, Sam Giancana, Momo, the famous yeah, gangster Momo. who ran Chicago, to, uh, to take care of uh, Castro and perhaps other people, right? Perhaps also perhaps JFK, right? So uh, it never was perfectly tied to uh, uh, Traficante and Giancana, but uh, through the figure of Carlos Mar Marcello, we find out that um, who, who is the mob boss of uh, well, New Louisiana. Orleans. Yeah. We find out that... Um, uh, Jeff FBI, that Hoover had withheld uh, tapes of Marcello talking about the need to get rid of the Kennedys, to go after them, to F them, et cetera. Uh, and that was all withheld. And so this is actually what led to a 1979 inquiry into a reinvestigation of the Warren Commission because of this uh, information that Hoover had withheld, probably because Hoover himself was blackmailed by the mafia or the CIA or both. And so, yeah, you, you, you pretty quickly come into finding out that there was a lot of people that seem to have been uh, used by uh, these power structures um, in many cases for assassinations, including 
I mean, one of the characters who was going to be called in to testify, uh, John Rosselli, uh, is mm -hmm. together with uh, uh, Momo and uh, Traficante. Uh, he dies like the day before, just like Sam Giancana. They die the day before this uh, 1979 inquiry. Right. So. It's just or, or uh, not 1979. They die. Uh, let's see. Rosselli died in 1976. It's uh, Giancana that dies the day before. But that's again. They 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 had a sense that the FBI uh, knew about a lot of these things. That doesn't mean the FBI is good guys. I'm just saying that that once the information that was in Hoover's thousand or hundreds of hours of tapes uh, got out, like it was over, right? So. You had to get rid of some of these uh, people that knew where the bodies were buried. Yeah, for sure. So I followed it when I did that line of research. I followed it chronologically, but I started in Britain. So I started with GCHQ and I started right. with MI6 and how did MI6 come about? And then MI6 starts working with organized crime well before American e America even has intelligence. MI6 was working organized crime internationally because that's kind of what they did. They were a front for the East India Company. Like, the, the old money transitioned into let's create intelligence and governments and these sort of things. So <clears throat> moving forward, uh, so it's Operation Underworld, 1938 starts in the UK, but we get into that same thing, 1942, because we're in the special relationship. And what Britain is showing us is, hey, welcome to the intelligence world. We deal humans and arms and drugs and all these sorts of things. Historically, this is how we have power. And we want you to be the next in line and be our property managers. So we're going to help you create OSS and CIA. And then while inside this country, we see it as CIA, mafia, maybe a couple other groups had motives on Kennedy, but there were international motives on Kennedy. The British sure. hated the Kennedys because they're Irish. They hated that Joe Kennedy was ambassador to the UK. They killed Joe Kennedy Jr. in Operation Aphrodite in 1943 in an airplane laden with explosives that was supposed to be remote controlled into a target, just like what they did on 9-11, but that never happened. So you can't talk about that. There's all these things that happened leading up to Kennedy's assassination. This is one of the best books. I'm, I'm going to present it. I'll present it like this. I've read a lot of books on all these topics. I'm not saying this is the best book. This is the book that most surprised me because it was written by Roger Stone. I read this book. I'm sure he had like a ghostwriter type dude. This guy helped him out. But the man who killed Kennedy, the case against LBJ mm -hmm. brings it bring. I'm not saying LBJ did it. However, it's an interesting story and narrative that matches up with a lot of other right. better source research. So right. I would never take Roger Stone as a source, but having read about it, I was like, this is a pretty good telling of the narrative as far as those things go. No, other than I, that, I, I, I don't really have any interest in Roger Stone. I think you're right. The evidence points in that direction of a combined interest of uh, the interest that LBJ had um, the CIA and the mafia. Well, LBJ had a personal thing and he definitely had a lot of people involved. And then he's surrounded by like, it was a Rhodes Scholar. Uh, was it the Katzenbach memo? The Jeffrey, is it Jeffrey Katzenbach? I forget his name. It's been so long, but there's a memo written. It says Oswald did it on, I think, you know, before they had done an investigation. They're like, oh, you know, maybe it was Sunday. By the time Oswald gets shot, they're like case closed. Oswald did it. Um, so there's a lot of layers to it. So for never getting into it, good for you. But now that you're into it, I made a 20 hour podcast a couple of years ago on the 50th anniversary of JFK. And what I put in that 20 hours is all the evidence I've never heard before. So we've all heard these usual things, but mm -hmm. I have like, here's the police officer who found the first weapon at the scene and it was a Mauser and he served in world war II and he knows the difference between a mm -hmm. Carcano, a, you know, Italian weapon and a world war II weapon. And there were all these contradictions and uh, there's a lot of Mark Lane speech in there. Right. Uh, but I was just trying to put it in a time capsule well, for people in the future. So they know that the chief executive of this country got assassinated. The people who killed him never got caught. They rose to power. They remain in power today. Yeah, I, I mean, I was I have Mark Lane's book, and I have uh, Jim Jim Mars's book, um, and I have uh, uh, the American Free Press guy. I forget his name, but um, the one where he talks about Mossad. So I, I've read different takes on it. It's just that it wasn't a thing that I was really into, and what reignited the interest in it was the mob angle. And again, I, I had really no interest in anything to do with JFK. It's just that. Um, what I wanted to do was look at the history of the five families and how they were structured. And by the way, after we did our talk and you mentioned the British angle, I actually went back uh, when I went to do the show with Alex in studio. On the way back, we went to Hot Springs and I redid the 
g- the gangster tour that they do in hot springs it's actually pretty good i recommend people go do that tour if you're interested in this topic because it is very historically based <laughs> and they do sell a lot of his uh historians books there like the the bell book on murder inc which is good but um And I did it because I had forgotten all the details relating to Oni Madden, who was the British gangster who was here from the UK to help set this stuff up. Uh, And so er, the early phases of of the mafia are not strictly Sicilian, right? There's multiple people at work, so to speak, different groups. Um, Exactly why it becomes the Sicilian mafia that's dominant for many, many years, I'm not really sure on that. But... Um, it does look like that the, that the dominance of a lot of the uh, unions and the, the uh, power structure in, in the, the East Coast uh, was taken over by the Sicilians by the time of uh, Lucky Luciano. So when Lucky organizes the five families at the uh, behest of uh, Meyer Lansky and some of the Jewish mobsters, we get the predominance of that family, that five family structure. And so that's what I found was, was so fascinating, not because... I'm particularly that interested or obsessed with the Italian mafia, just that that gives us a window into the geopolitical power structure at, at, from a macrocosmic level. Right. And and everybody knows about just like everybody watches spy movies, everybody likes and has watched countless mafia movies. Right. And we know that this is real, even though Hoover for many years said there's no such thing as the Cosa Nostra, as he was like literally covering up for the Cosa Nostra. Um Everybody can recognize that, okay, maybe there's corruption at at, uh, this little level or local level, or uh, there's corrupt cops and there's corrupt politicians, but there's no international. No, no, no. These things are a window into how there's international corruption. That's the point. Yeah, I had had an interest. So it's good that we're comparing notes because when I went down this road, I put the mafia in there because, okay, let's let's learn about that. And then I got the Chicago outfit, the Corsican mm-hmm. mafia. I mm-hmm. got Roselli over here. These weren't necessarily organized under the five families yet. I had the Irish mafia, the Jewish mafia, the Sicilian mafia. <laughs> oh, what's that all about? And then you can start to see that's where the Chicago outfit came from. That's where Mar- uh, Mar- yeah. uh, Marcello's in. Uh, right. Sindona also was involved. So there's there's a, a whole lot to learn. And as I was going through, I was like, I should map this out. I mean, who is Giuseppe Mazzini and what is yes, his influence exactly. on uh, these sort of secret societies? And did he, you know, well, that, yeah, I was unclear on how there was a Masonic connection to the mafia and the Merta. I, I know that there was for a long time. Cause uh, several years ago I'd read um, about Joe Valachi and his testimony that there was these uh, oaths and these blood oaths and these, you know, ritual, uh, ceremonies and i was familiar with the the rituals of freemasonry so i but i didn't know the exact exact origin of that and that's so when i went and got into the history through uh, uh selwyn robb's a pretty well-known famous book um he actually goes into the the under garibaldi the unifier of england or excuse me of italy <clears throat> uh, garibaldi was uh, a, a a super disciple of massini and that's how and and, and garibaldi used the maviosi as his soldiers I have Orsini in here. I have, I don't know if I have Garibaldi or not. The, the young Americans, the young Turks, the young Russians, the young Polish, the young Hegelians. There's a lot of young groups under Mazzini. Yes. I remember and so he about- influenced Garibaldi's uh, unification program for Italy. And it was this kind of like revolutionary nationalism that was um, pretty liberal. I mean, in the sense of for the time. Um, but it, it, but it attracted these, these older medieval era, uh, uh, Sicilian sort of peasantry. And there were more so libertarian patriots in the middle ages. You could call them the, the people that would defend Sicily from invaders by the time of the unification, they were, uh, it was a, it was a mix of people. So you have a lot of people that were thieves that were brigands that were all kinds of all the way over to, you know, just, uh, self-defense patriot minded people um and so maviosi kind of evolves over time to be local chieftains local militia that also includes uh kind of dubious figures right and so garibaldi i think under this time this is when you begin to see right uh, a lot of freemasonic influence in italy and so it, at some point there that's where the oath of omerta bears all of the who exactly came up with the oath i have no idea but i'm just saying that it you th- this is the where we have the masonic connection is that he was influenced by mazzini and he 
uh, and he uh, uh, recruited all of these uh, mafiosi to be his soldiers. Yeah, I, I uh, mapped out Omerta. I was like, what's oh, this? Okay. It's like, okay, yeah, the, cool. the secret society, word of honor. You got to keep your secret about these right. things. And it allows a whole bunch of things that go on underneath underneath right. it that are facilitated, right? Exactly. Uh, and then coming up to like Propaganda Due, the Masonic Lodge, right. you have like the merging of these things and they come public. Because when I first saw the Godfather series, I didn't know mafia was a real thing. I was just like, these are movies, right? But I did remember in, in Godfather 3, uh, International Immobile Yare, they had like the whole Vatican banks, you know, scandal thing in there. And uh, the, later you find out these things are actual. There are secret societies. They do have influence on institutions, but you don't see them up front because the institutions are out front for people like you know, the, the, the buildings of state and the buildings of a lot of the religious institutions around the world in the 20th century, especially after the Dulles brothers became in, you know, in charge of the world council on churches as part of their strategy for controlling the population. Exactly. There's, and this is what's kind of left out. It's the occult part. It's the hidden part because we see forward facing, Oh, there's Washington DC. There's a president. He's the chief executive, but that's the bottom level of influence that we see. It's not the top level. And there's a lot of influences from outside the White House that influence the policy and direction of our country that have nothing to do with our votes. So to continue to go through life without these things on our radar, it just means we're believing in the cartoon instead of actually looking to see what the reality is. Yeah. I mean, the idea of uh, we hear the term, right, deep state, shadow government, cryptocracy sort of passed around all the time. Um, but the way that that structure, structure actually works and operates is very similar to the way that the mafia is structured, right? There's this sort of cell structure and it insulates the higher level from ever getting caught or prosecuted. And that's, this is why for so many decades, um, organized crime was so successful and unable on the part of the feds to be busted. Uh, they would they would bust all these low level people all the time, but the low level people literally were so compartmentalized they had no idea wh who the boss was. For many, like uh, one of the guys who's flipped the Joe lot, like he he had heard of these bosses, but he didn't know the he didn't never met the boss. He's just a lowly foot soldier guy, right? And so, in the same way, we can see that uh, insulated compartmentalized structure, kind of like a military. And in fact, uh, the the mafia was structured on the old ancient Roman centurion model. Uh, where you you compartmentalize what the low level people know, so uh, this worked very well. Uh, same situation with Murder Inc. Um, one of the ways that they were insulated was that the people who were doing the hits in Murder Inc., the contract killing, they didn't actually know who or why they were doing it for. They were just told what to do and where the payment would be. And this was really difficult for the feds uh, for many many decades to figure out and to bust. And so that is parallel to the way that our deep state structure works where you have this sort of shadow parallel intelligence apparatus, banking apparatus, this kind of behind the scenes. And then you've got all these public cartoon characters like the politicians that you're talking about that we're always focused on, right? As if they run the whole show, right? As if a guy who's a politician that makes a hundred thousand dollars a year literally runs everything and not the guys that make, you know, trillions, right? Uh, that can control the private banks, right? Uh, so we're, we're just given all these, these uh, front figures and Whenever there is a serious bust, right? What does the owned corporate mainstream media do? Oh, well, they always tell us, oh, it's just low level. It's just criminals. There's nothing organized. It's exactly what Hoover did, right? This whole time, Hoover was lying and saying that there's no such thing as organized crime or, or the Cosa Nostra. It's, it's a conspiracy theory. And he would literally tell his agents it was a conspiracy theory. Meanwhile, at the exact same time as Hoover is saying this, there's another bureau called the Bureau of Narcotics run by Anslinger. I'm not saying this makes Anslinger a good guy. It's not about good or bad. It's just the facts. Anslinger had all of this information that he had collected on the heroin trade and that it was 90% run by Lucky Luciano and the uh, Sicilian Mafia in, those, in that time period in the 40s and 50s. Yeah, so, so they as, had contracts for murders and they had the heroin trade. And he had all this information and Hoover was literally just lying and saying that, no, there's no such thing as organized crime. It doesn't exist. There's just low-level dudes that commit crime. 
Yeah. So uh, Resorts International. So they had front companies for Murder, Inc. And they can invest in things. And uh, this is a whole line of research that, again, it's it's off most people's radar. You, like, you think, oh, that's, uh, you know, the Resorts International. It's not a mafia front for like all this other stuff that goes on behind the scenes, drugs and assassinations. And um, but the thing is, <clears throat> The organized crime with our intelligence community, the FBI, the CIA, all those great, uh, you know, three letter agencies that didn't just stop with that. It right. became the template for working with Central and South America in a whole bunch of other drug trades. And that came up through Iran Contra. I mean, it's still going on today, to be quite honest. So there's a long legacy. It's been almost 100 years that this has been going on. And taxpayer dollars spend billions and billions and billions in the investigative agencies that are really in control of this they have a handle on it they just have the other handle not the one we think where they're going to stop it they're like no we'll we'll hit the brakes every now and then but otherwise we're letting it flood in and we're taking our cut yeah i i wasn't even aware before getting into this that the relationship between uh you know important mob figures and the intelligence apparatus it, it goes way back in fact it goes back to uh vito genovese who was the obviously the the father of the genovese uh, family crime family, um, he, he worked with the U.S. military. So uh, the military first called upon him as a consultant, um, as an organized crime figure, because they wanted to know all the logistics of harbors mm -hmm. and the, the, because they can, the mob controlled the unions and the unions, you know, were obviously related to the dock workers and all this. So they knew all this, they needed all the intel on the harbors. And the funny thing about uh, Don Vito was that he had, uh, a pretty, I'm, I think I'm right. I'm going from I think he was previously buddies at pro Mussolini, right? And so he just switched sides and said, oh, "Okay, well, I, I love U.S. military now," uh, and and would play both sides, right, between being pro Mussolini, pro U.S. Uh, and and profited from both sides. So there's a little version, a little microcosm of a person who is a crime figure and played both sides in this you know geopolitical war conflict and and benefited very well from playing both sides and. He's just a window into the larger plays of how the banking establishment, the the arms trafficking, right? They can play both sides in a war. They can get both countries into debt. But you see it at the macro and micro scale is all I'm trying to say. And he's not the only one. There's other famous mob figures. Uh, it was actually controversial when it came out that they had come, they had consulted the U.S. military and uh, they were given awards. Right? Some of these guys got, uh, you know, Patriot Awards for being organized crime figures that had helped out the U.S. military. So... Uh, there's there's a long history of this but that's not even uh conspiratorial it's just like basic history and of course yeah most people don't know about that kind of stuff so yeah so it's just overlooked oh it's this button here yeah i'm gonna i'll read it into the record operation underworld this is the excuse that they had because of the war they got to work with the criminals operation right. underworld was the united states government's code name for the cooperation of italian and jewish organized crime figures from 1942 to 1945 um like but it started in the UK in 1938. So the U S side starts, you know, it's got uh, four years behind the, you, you think they're on the, uh, the inside when they're four years behind the, the whole operation. No, uh, to counter Axis, that's German spies and saboteur German and Japanese along the United States, Northeastern sort seaports to avoid wartime labor union strikes and limit theft by black marketeers of vital war supplies and equipment. Nevertheless, Fears about possible shortage or disruption of the waterfront led Commander Charles R. Haffenden of the U.S. Navy Office of Naval Intelligence, uh, where Jack Prasobic works, uh, Third Naval District in New York, to set up a special security unit. He sought the help of Joseph Lanza, who ran the Fulton Fish Market, to get in intelligence about the New York waterfront under uh, yep. control of the labor unions and Lucky Luciano, New York crime families. Etc. It's real history. People should check into it, and uh, that's where it starts. But it kind of still goes on today. It's yeah. I mean, there uh, you can you can go into now. I don't know about like the present day per se. About uh, I mean, I have come up with some pretty good articles that discuss. Uh, there's one at, actually at GQ of all places that discusses uh, the present day um, relationship of the mafia to uh, power structures and all that, but. Um, yeah, it gets like another example would be Vatican Bank. And as you said earlier, with uh, the P2 Mafia and the figure of Roberto Calvi, who ends up being <laughs> killed uh, by the P2 uh, Mafia for, um, well, it, that's a long story, but it points to uh, corruption in the Vatican Bank. And 
so there's another level of international connection between uh, intelligence agencies, between um, Operation Gladio, right, uh, which was a Western intelligence agency to, you know, do basically false flags in in uh, uh, Europe against the communists uh, under the guise of, well, it's wartime, it's Cold War, we got to do anything we can to stop to stop the commies, right? Uh, wartime always becomes this uh, ends justifies the means me, way to do whatever you want. But I did want to say too that um, yeah, like like as you know, uh, the, the 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 British controlling a lot of those opium pipelines and drug pipelines. Everybody knows about this in regard to China, right? Um, opium wars and all that. Well, uh, this, these are the p- pipelines that the OSS took over from British and French intelligence. And so it's the old empire of Pax Britannia giving way to Pax Americana. And uh, who controls drug pipelines? Well, organized crime, right? So you're gonna, if you're going to work with those guys, then you're going to learn the British model of doing that. <laughs> All right. And so this is where the OSS exactly picks up the very things that uh, uh, MI5, MI6, uh, and, and French intelligence had previously been doing um, to run the black markets for Uncle Sam. Yeah, and they really get America to go international with its endeavors and really take uh, management of some of the, the the British Empire's properties around the world so we can be front-facing. And uh, the British had had uh, first, second, and third Anglo-Afghan wars, but now America can have it as its longest war without an end with no point other than to guard the poppy fields and the oil pipelines. Yeah, I, I've forgotten too. Um, I would say that you, know, you were asking about... Uh, like present day, the, the closest thing I could find to the present day hitman assassin type of thing, which I mean, there's plenty of books that discuss potential assassinations. And I mean, we know that there have been, uh, you know, recent assassinations of political figures. Uh, oh, who was the uh, the woman, the, the, the president of Pakistan? She actually spoke at my university like a year before she was assassinated by one of the uh, radical Islamic groups. Uh, her name escapes me at the moment, but um, I mean, there have been, you know, recent fairly significant political assassinations, but um, the, mo- the, the again, the more relevant area where I was finding parallel here was the connection between figures who are in the organized crime world uh, that are also over in the military assassin world. Right. And so um, uh, what was I just I was. Oh, uh, so the figure of Manson. Right. He's running around in the circles with uh, I think his name Min- Minsler Minster. And he's the guy that kills Roy Radin uh, in a contract killing, who is the producer of the movie The Cotton Club. Uh, Radin, I'm pretty sure, is a, is a mafia-connected figure. That's why that contract killing went down. And, and uh, he, as well as a couple other organized crime figures, um, a- again, bridge a lot of these seemingly disconnected famous cases and stories. There's another character um, who's actually, and this is not me, but actually uh, even mainstream local news channels have done multiple reports on uh, figures that bridge uh, the world between famous um, serial killers. Uh, there's a figure that bridges the world of uh, Jomaine Gacy and his connections to uh, organized crime in the form of P-R-O-N, PRON, we'll say, um, and uh, a killer-connected creep, John David Norman, uh, and another serial killer that's lesser known, known as the Candyman. Uh, so there, the, what, and the reason I bring this up is that when you look into this case, there's actually a really good uh, podcast series that was done called uh, The Clown and the Candyman. It's like an eight part series. Anybody interested in this, I highly recommend it because when you start to look into that, you'll notice this is the 70s version of Epstein. Uh, there was an entire island that was set up in uh, Michigan. Um, North Fox Island. And this was an elite island that they were flying people into. This even connected up to the, to uh, high level executives at GM. Uh, and this was a compromise operation. And the character of John David Norman, who is the sort of illegal prawn PRON figure here, uh, has a, a guy working for him who was burying bodies for John Wayne Gacy. <laughs> okay. And this is a guy by the name of Paskey, P A S K E. And what I'm getting at is that this is a, 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 a recent wild thing that has come about that nobody's denying, right? This connecting to seemingly disparate international, in other words, it's making it at least national and perhaps international in terms of this 70s version of Epstein that was going on. And Gacy's directly connected to these people 
in other in other stories, uh, Paskey, I think uh, the, the the way that I'm trying to remember the way that it gets from Candyman to John David Norman. That one escapes and maybe the figure of Paskey. But uh, in both cases, it's relating to national child PRON rings and compromise operations through the North Fox Island elites that were flying people into this island camp right uh in michigan in the 70s and this all came out i've read all the news clippings it's it's just a forgotten lesser known case that's connecting two serial killers it's wild um and in fact there was an old documentary uh, i've not been able to find it but it was produced in the late 70s out of texas by texas law enforcement i watched it maybe five years ago it used to be on youtube and it was local texas police and and dallas police officials doing their own local access TV show about the dangers of the rising problems of human trafficking in, in Texas and in Dallas. Right. And this is directly or at the same time as this was coming out about the candy man, who is one of these uh, serial killers who was doing this stuff to kids. Uh, and it, it was all being filmed and the, the PRON was being sent and shipped around. Uh, the figure of John David Norman is the, the point man for who had, uh, I think, two or three thousand index cards of elites and people all over who would order this PRON. Uh, anyway, point being is that this is all out now. Right. This is all uh, in, in big, famous true crime podcasts. I'm not that interested in true crime, but I'm only interested in it because it connects a lot of these seemingly disparate worlds right? that you and I are talking about. So we have the direct connection of very, very wealthy uh, uh, executives, uh, serial killers, inter national and perhaps international PRON networks. And I don't just mean nude women. I'm talking about the really sick stuff right like yeah the franklin SNUFF stuff yeah the franklin cover-up stuff uh, yes in the in the book franklin cover-up it mentions hunter thompson that he was the guy filming the snuff films that's i remember well, you know what has uh, i didn't realize that uh, in the case of most of these famous serial killers uh i can't say in every case but in most of these cases they were filming it uh, in fact, there was even if you you can look up Jeffrey Dahmer's apartment. I mean, he's got a security camera set up in the apartment. So just like BTK, right, he would photograph all this stuff. Um, a lot of these people will sell the stuff, right? That's that's part of what they're doing. And in many cases, they're doing this even comes up in the in the Manson story is that reportedly again, I, I can't prove all these, but reportedly uh, what was going on at the Tate Polanski households uh, uh was extreme prawn uh that was being sold but they run cover for it because they write a story like once upon a time in hollywood and the guy who made that tarantino he's someone who's stuck up for that type of behavior before right yeah well he, he's the, defended the uh, polanski exactly right so the yeah. idea is that uh that, oh, these are isolated incidents. But what we're starting to realize, especially in the last five to 10 years, you know, post Franklin cover up is that Franklin cover up was not an isolated, uh, you know, oh, well, well, there's one bad case of a few bad apples that did really bad. No, no, no. These are networks that are international and the evidence just keeps coming out to, to expose and show that all the way up from Penn State, right, to DC Madam, to Saville, to uh, all the recent uh, uh, Operation um, Air, uh, Air, Arrow, whatever it was, from Interpol and uh, Canada, right? There's there's busts of this stuff all the time, and they're connected networks is the point. All right, so you've been studying uh, serial killers, contract killers, JFK. I'll match two of those up. Have you looked into Woody Harrelson's dad and, and yeah. what he used to? Yeah, so that's interesting that Woody Harrelson was in uh, Natural Born Killers, and that his dad was a contract killer, uh, but he's just a nice guy from Cheers, and you know. <laughs> well, that 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 reminds me of all those cases where you know people who um, are literally playing CIA spies literally then work for the CIA, uh, like Jennifer Garner, um, like uh, uh, George Clooney. Uh, George Clooney, uh, Angelina Jolie, right? They're openly in the CFR. They're openly 
Um, Melissa Mayhe, the, the uh, woman, the CIA operative who wrote uh, Denial and Deception, she's the woman who trained uh, Angelina Jolie for <laughs> I don't know how long to to do a role, right? So they'll have this uh, this front thing where it's like, oh, I'm training for this role to play the CIA operative in Salt, right? Uh, and I'm studying under my CIA handler for a movie for six months, right? Oh, really? Uh, but then you come out as a person at the same time around this time this movie comes out, so all, where she's literally in the CFR, right? <laughs> so uh, I think that this is this is much more. I mean, obviously not every A-list actor is is a spy, but this they're useful. Yeah, they it, have access. They collect yeah, information. Yeah, and, it, and it's, people it's will more tell common them than we think, right? Yeah. I mean, this is this is why you have that clip of Ben Affleck saying, I think, you know, most he says something like the uh, CIA and Hollywood are flip sides of the same coin, right? Hollywood's full of spies. And uh, there was an old clip of uh, um, Bruce that I can't find anymore. Bruce Willis basically saying the same type of thing. I'm not saying that I know that Bruce Willis was a spy, but he was basically saying something along the same lines of what Ben Affleck says in that, uh, I think it's a Guardian or a Telegraph interview that you can still pull up. Yeah, and I don't think they're like, uh, it's not like they're doing the things they do in the movies in real life. It's not like Tom Cruise gets done filming Mission Impossible and then he goes and does some espionage. But people (laughs) in those positions have access. People tell them things. There's all sorts, you know, there's, that's what, you know, and traditionally when you look at spies that we know about through history, I mean, that's where, uh, uh, you know, Ian Fleming gets the whole idea for James Bond. Like that was based on Sidney Riley, a real spy. And a whole you know, composite of other spies as well. Yeah, but- the, the, the most famous act, the Russian actress, uh, she's a real, w- w- I always forget her name because it's like a really long Russian name, but she uh, was the most famous Russian actress during Stalin's reign. Uh, she was a spy for Stalin uh, on Hitler. Uh, so there you go. Like the most famous Russian actress under Stalin. So in other words, it's not just something that like the U.S. does with Hollywood. Uh, it's actually a, a fairly common thing. And when you go back to, you know, England and, and Globe Theater and, you know, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's makes perfect sense that an actor, high level actor, especially a list actor would be a spy. By the way, uh, many bands have been fronts for this too. Um, there is compelling evidence that suggests that um, when, te- when the band Tesla went to do that stupid fall of the wall uh, concert, right? Winds of Change. Um, that was actually a uh, f- cover operation for a uh, CIA operation. Uh, was it Tesla uh, or the Scorpions? The Scorpions are. Oh, it was the Scorpions. Yeah, I'm sorry. Scorpions. I'm sorry. <laughs> I get my ballad 80s ballad bands mixed hey, up. Hey, man, you shouldn't. You, you know, actually, I can't, about those stand, 80s I can't stand that genre. <laughs> Take me the moment of tomorrow. I remember that much of it. I know how the song goes, but yes, you're right. It's Scorpions. Excuse me. Um, I actually had a. a, a um, a story told me one time about, I obviously I can't, I can't prove any of this, but the, there was a guy who, who claimed to know some curious things about Metallica that, that uh, there was more things going on in terms of Metallica concerts and shows. Now, again, I can't prove that. I don't know if that's true, but what I'm getting at is that um, it's not accidental that somebody like Scooter Libby would be a uh, production consultant on a movie called Red Scorpion that Dolph Lundgren is in. Uh, because movie productions we know can be great covers for um, those kinds of operations. Right. I mean, look, the, the, the whole movie Argo is about that, right? The whole movie wag the dog puts it in your face. Get, hold the Tostitos bag. No, we want a Calico cat. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was 96 and, and it was about a movie director, Stanley, who couldn't keep his mouth shut and ended up perishing. And then Kubrick died three years after that yeah just randomly coming across i was reading about um natalie portman's grandmother i think this is right uh was worked for british intelligence yes i'm pretty a lot of times these things are in the family so you know it's it's it it's a lot more common than people people think right mo berg right it works he's a catcher famous baseball catcher but he's also working for the oss well who's um there's an actor. What did he play? Cause he's not very good. It's the, it's the lineage. It's like John Ford's grandson. And on one side, he has the opium magnates, uh, from India, uh, Sassoon and Rothschild on one side. And on the other side, he has some other, it, it, it's a really interesting composite when you see where 
if the two sides of the family come from and he's a Hollywood star. So that tells you kind of what you need to know. There's a power structure and those people want their kids to go out there and tell you and your family how to live your life and these sort of things, set these trends, make people believe things that don't aren't true. And then they're like, they're on the other side of the curtain. They're on the stage. They see backstage. They see side stage. They see what's above the stage, but the people in the audience, they see something else. They see. The yeah. Show. I mean, everybody knows who Hitchcock is. Most people don't know that Hitchcock was filming war propaganda. Uh, that was one of the most uh, important things that he did for the British government. He worked for the Ministry of Information, and he, he did a lot of uh, war reels and war propaganda. Um, yeah, I think he filmed Dachau. I think he filmed uh, the gas chamber that they used for mattresses at Dachau that they officially say was never used on human beings. I think that's where the footage comes from. And then Billy Wilder also did a lot of that, too. And so yeah. did Frank Capra which is a shame because I like It's a Wonderful Life. But other than that, Frank Capra made a lot of propaganda for Uncle Sam, for sure. Yeah, I remember you were talking about what you just said earlier. You mentioned that when you actually saw the thing, it, it hit home. I forget which thing you were talking about when you watched the actual clip. But uh, I remember that uh, it was a few years ago after I'd read Dave's book on Laurel Canyon uh, and the Air Force's studios there. It was a couple of years later, ago, later that somebody found the archive footage and put it up on a YouTube channel. And just to see it uh, firsthand, right, because you read about, oh, Jimmy Stewart and all these figures go to this underground secret studio to film propaganda. And then they declass. You could watch the declassified mm -hmm. footage. It, sh it should still be on YouTube, but you can watch, you know, Jimmy Stewart literally, literally there doing his little Jimmy Stewart, right, talking about the FBI, talking about how uh, Uncle Sam is, you know, great and all this stuff. And, and yeah, he, he was a kind of a adjunct for the FBI. I mean, he, he actually filmed a whole movie that was FBI propaganda called the FBI story. Um, so this was, if you look into history, this is, this is really common, right? Now, what I haven't figured out is exactly what's going on with Marilyn Monroe, because she was also, she also had regular access to uh, Laurel Canyon Studios and has a Department of Defense badge. Uh, and we know, of course, that she was sleeping with um, Momo and JFK and somebody else I forget who one underworld figure somebody bobby ends. jfk probably everybody Mo Momo, <laughs> so, <laughs> johnny roselli johnny Rose whole, okay yeah, maybe yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh was she being used as like a um honey trap probably i mean this is yeah. very you know I, I hate i thought the movie was terrible propaganda but um uh the movie with uh, uh jennifer lawrence red sparrow Right. Well, that presents it like, oh, it's, uh, you know, only the Russians have sex spies. Really? <laughs> I mean, there's like, uh, really? I mean, now that Epstein's come out, you're going to say that really that only Russian intelligence use sex spies? Come on, get real. I mean, the, but what's interesting about Red Sparrow is not the propaganda. That's pretty transparent. But that the way that they recruit her in and demoralize her to make her into a sex operative is very illustrative. Wasn't Mata Hari a German spy? Or, uh, yeah. And I remember that uh, 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 even better than Mata Hari is the Profumo affair, right? So he was compromised by uh, a famous uh, swallow operation. There's actually a lot of these, right? And, um, you know, Anna Chapman, she was obviously going to be some kind of swallow operation. That's another example mm -hmm. of this, but you know, the idea that, that Western intelligence is are good guys and they don't do that is just laughable. It's ludicrous. It, oh, it was the Axis powers and the Soviets. They did that, not us. Well, I think also people look at American foreign policy and intelligence work. to It's supposed to reflect American values. So, of course, we wouldn't be doing these things. Oh, but wait a minute. Epstein. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> He's protected from on high. They knew about it for years and years and years. Savile. Savile. There's I mean, a, a lot, uh, a lot of uh, Franklin cover up. A lot of these are compromise operations, right? There's a, there's a, a video. It's a two part video. It's still on YouTube. As far as I know, it's a journalist called Ben fellows. And if you just type in Ben fellows, police tape, he had the, the, like the London vice police, two guys come in. He has hidden webcams in his apartment. So you can see and hear the whole thing. He tells them that as a child star in Britain, he was abused. He was, he was naming a whole bunch of very familiar names. Some of the names mm -hmm. that have already been mentioned here. Um, and they tell him at the end. Yeah, this is all going on and no, we're not going to do anything about it. We've known about it for years. These people are untouchable, but we wanted to kind of let you get your story out. So you feel better. Now you don't need to talk about it. Have a nice day. And I was like, shit man 
I was like, this is like, these are vice squad guys. These are from like the, you know, they're supposed to be the people you can go to for protection. And they're like, no, we protect the people who abuse. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, that's very telling about the world. And that's a harsh lesson. And I don't know that I don't, I don't know that I want to learn that lesson early, early in life, but my parents <laughs> should be protecting me from that. And when you get to be an adult, you have to figure out how does the world actually work? And there are very powerful people like Jimmy Savile was protected for 40 years, man, 40 years. He had access yes. to mental institutions and handicapped kids and all sorts of stuff. And he's friends with the queen. He's friends with Prince Andrew. He's friends with Prince Charles. He's friends with all of them. Yeah, well, I mean, this is the power of blackmail. I mean, uh, uh, speaking of Savile, uh, a couple of things that come to mind there, which is that um, he, so uh, the serial killer, the Yorkshire Ripper, um, one of the bodies of the Yorkshire Ripper was found on Jimmy Savile's property. <laughs> so, uh, and, and they are famously known to have been close associates who was also best friends, both of them just happened to be best friends with another serial killer. I'm not joking. Look up. The, yeah, I'm not kidding. Uh, it's very name, macabre. Uh, his name is uh, Ian Ian something. Uh, but th so there's Peter Sutcliffe is, is the Yorkshire Ripper, who's best friends with Savile, and then there's the other guy, Ian somebody, who's the other serial killer, and they're all, all they all just happen to magically be friends. Oh, and then and of course Ian the Ian one is uh, literally into witchcraft, has his own like witchcraft coven. Uh, but all of that to say that that yeah, you can see that this is a another example of a clear connection between the world of serial killers. In the world of intelligence and compromise via Savile, in the world of uh, uh, organized crime. Um, well, I'm sure it was just all like it's happenstance, coincidence. It don't, it's a bad egg situation. That's how it's played out that's in the a, media. But, right. It, so it doesn't connect to the Hellfire Club. It doesn't connect to Ben Franklin's residences. They found in archaeological digs well, bodies of kids in both you know, guess places what? he lived. Uh, so there's a. a uh, kind of popular uh, gritty pulp noir crime drama series from the BBC that's pretty famous. That's a trilogy called Red Riding. And guess what Red Riding does in the fiction? It connects it all and it implicates the police in Britain for covering it up, but it's fiction. Mm. So I, I've just been watching the Red Riding trilogy, which again is about, uh, I highly recommend it by the way, because it's about the Yorkshire Ripper. Um, and with the first two installments are about how the police work together to cover it up and how it goes up to the highest levels uh, of the power structure. So they don't mind putting it in the fiction and showing you. Yeah. And then um, uh, that's making me think of, I mean, it was popularized in Western culture with Jack the Ripper. And then the stories of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who was a big proponent of the Anglo-American establishment being set up and that sort of thing. So is there access between these writers of science fiction, Ian Fleming, not so much Fleming, but HG Wells, Conan Doyle, these, you know, the, the, the mystery, the writers uh, that se seemed also to be like a key to the spy craft class as used by the, the empire exactly. was they want these influential writers to be out right. there and they can go on speaking tour and they can travel under the guise of research, you know, and it's almost like Indiana Jones esque. And they can steer the narrative, right? If, if you have the approved, uh, you know, spy writers and a fiction and fiction writers, they can steer the narrative. Uh, I don't know why they, the, they really like that phrase, the Ripper. <laughs> I mean, it's like from Jack, the Ripper to the Yorkshire. I think there's another Ripper too. The, the, the Brits really love this phrase, the Ripper for their serial killers. But uh, uh, yeah, uh, um, I don't have any particular uh, take on the uh, uh, Jack, the Ripper, although it does, seem to be probably something like what's in from hell. <laughs> if you've watched the Johnny Depp movie, right. Where it's like these high level Masons. Right. And they have a, they have an assassin character. Who's the doctor. Who's the abortion doctor, whatever. Um, that's probably what it is. I wouldn't be surprised, but uh, um, yeah, I mean, this, this is, this is kind of what governments have known for a long time, which is that uh, just like the mafia knew uh isn't a stable of psychopaths uh, useful if you're the government, right? I mean, if you want, if you're, if you're the mafia and they have access to a stable of 250 contract killers, don't you think uncle Sam or the government has, I mean, they, they train people to become effective killers, right? This is what government does. What's so, the difference between government and the mafia? 
Uh, not much. <laughs> Names? Moff- what? The ma- mafia doesn't have a compulsory 15,000 hour indoctrination oh, to convince you that they're not the mafia. <laughs> yeah so right that and, and what do they always get the mobsters on <laughs> tax evasion right? and so, conspiracy that's the real yeah, mob yeah. right yeah, all exactly. right so uh what are you working on these days what challenges are in front of you what's going what's like what's jay going forward in 2021 with well we're going to do a, a exclusive uh show on rockfin so a look for that uh in the near future um so uh i know a lot of us uh, have have uh been looking that way and, and doing uh, content for Rockfin, so I'm looking forward to doing that. Um, You're I on Rockfin right now, bro. Right, that's, one, that's, that's what I'm saying. I think we're going to we're going to structure it as a uh, something a little uh, simpler to start out with. Just going to be the Jay Dyer show. It's just going to be about 30 minutes. Um, so it'll be a range of topics. Uh, it, it might be boil downs. It might be brand new material that you've not heard me talk about. Uh, Because a lot of my content is half and half, right? So people that want access, you know, you've got a four or five year archive of half and half material. Um, So uh, it'll probably be structured in a similar way, but in in a shorter form, uh, because I do have a lot of irons in the fire. So beyond the Rockfin show, which will be about once a week, uh, I'll be doing a a continued breakdown of the relationship between the serial killers uh, and assassin programs and MKUltra. Um, I've got many, many installments. I've got a, about 50 pages of notes I've taken that I haven't even got through yet. So hopefully that'll be a useful series, just like Tragedy Hope was a good series that I did. Um, uh, that's what's going now. And I have a couple books in the works uh, dealing with philosophy in the West, um, the idea of God in the West uh, that, are, that are behind. I'm, I'm behind schedule on that. So I, I can't say when, I, when those will be done, but uh uh, anyway, that's what's to come. Then I think I'm going to release another book uh, of old essays that I wrote about metaphysics, philosophy. Um, I have about a book's length worth of that stuff as well, uh, and unpublished essays, unpublished movie reviews, that kind of stuff. So that's probably what I'll be doing the next uh, six months. Right on. Oh, and I, and, I, and okay. I will be hosting also still continue to host the uh, fourth, hour, fourth hour of Alex Jones uh, every week or two. Yeah, is there a, a consistent date or like day when you do? No, that? it's it like just Thursday? random. It's whenever they need you. Totally random. Yeah, you're on call. You like it ends up being about once every week or two. It's great though because you turn it into the Jay Dyer show. It just has Infowars logo at the corner, <laughs> but otherwise, it's a real uh, breath of fresh air compared well, to what's yeah Appreciate compared that. to what they're usually doing. Now, how do we get you to do more impressions when you're doing those Infowars shows? Because I think that's one of the strongest points of contact is you can make people laugh about these things yeah, and then they can hear, you know, it's like salt with the medicine or sugar with the medicine. That's what you got to do. Yeah. A spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. I guess that's to be the mood. I, you know, I never know when they're going to ask. Right. So Daria just basically like texts me some a, a random morning and be like, can you do today? <laughs> so I'd never really, so I'm not, it just happens to be whatever mood I'm in that day. So if I'm in like a serious research mode, uh, my mind is, you know, I'm not really thinking of being ridiculous, but if yeah. I'm in a ridiculous mode, yeah, then I'll probably be yeah, ridiculous. Yeah, I'll, I'll throw some more impersonations. Up. Yeah. Ridiculous. Goofy J a little bit is good. Not all the time. Because we like your serious, studious, academic type of repertoire. Well, I may try to throw more of the goofy stuff into the Rockfin show because, I mean. Oh, that'd be good. Yeah. uh, I've been wanting to talk about other things other than, I mean, the geopolitical stuff and all this dark serial killer murder ink crap is like, it's really dark. So at times I want to have that, you know, just Sam Hyde style craziness to just kind of, I don't know, talk about something ridiculous like high school. (laughs) <laughs> I'm ruminating hey, on doing stuff like that too hey uh something ridiculous that i saw in the last 24 hours was alex jones on that flagrant two podcast i've heard it, about this i, I had it playing in the background I've yesterday because i was like what is this and he's in miami and it's a whole different vibe down there and i was like wow there's a whole it was a different side of jones that most people don't usually get to see it was, it was I heard he, he got a little wild i heard right? <laughs> <laughs> to say the least <laughs> they is it like up. when he's on like Joe Rogan or is it different than that? It 10 X Rogan. Oh, like look. what he does on Rogan is very tame compared to what was going on in that. And that's my ad for now something that's this. not very substantial, but it could be lots of chuckles. A lot of fun. Okay. <laughs> All right. So where can people find your work? Where can they support you? What do they get when they support you? Anything? How's it work? So uh, if you go to jaysanalysis.com, if you're interested in uh, my two 
I don't know where they are. Two books on Hollywood. I have two books, Esoteric Hollywood 1 and 2, and you can support me by buying those in the shop at the website. And the advantage is you get signed copies, right? So if you go support it, support Jeff Bezos by buying it on Amazon, it doesn't do me any good. So please buy it from me in the shop. Uh, and the other thing you can do is subscribe to my weekly talks and lectures via the archives of the podcast. So typically um, once a week, we do a talk, a, a special feature that's half and half. Um, that ranges from geopolitics, history, religion, uh, movie analysis, clowning around, all the above. Uh, and there's five years of that archive material, which very much on the model of kind of what you do, Richard, it, it's intended to be educational. Uh, so there's a lot of that. And then we also, I do a lot of debates. I do a lot of um, that kind of stuff too with uh, uh, prominent debater figures across the spectrum from atheist to Muslim, et cetera. Um, and then you can follow me on YouTube. You can follow me on uh, 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 Twitter as well. All right. Next time you come back, I want to hear about how you got into debating and things that people in the audience can use to bridge the gap. Cause you seem to be rather pleasant and successful that, you know, being able to present ideas and defend your position, but be open-minded. I think that's a skill set that more people need to learn. And like I said, uh, next time we'll, we'll put something together where you can share some of that knowledge so that yeah. people can get a, get a step up. It won't just be entertain entertaining info about the history of the mafia working with the government will help the, the audience raise their. Well, actually, well. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's sort of, as I'm sure you're aware, you know, knowing basic logic, knowing basic approaches to reasoning and argumentation. I mean, that's not a skill set that's reserved just to the intellectual world or to the liberal arts. I mean, that's very useful in business. Yeah. It's useful for everybody and they wish to keep it to themselves. And that's what creates that knowledge gap, power gap, dynamic right. so we'll, well thanks for helping us bridge at this time and uh we'll get you back on the show soon awesome thank you so much for having me it was a pleasure Great and you're welcome to hang out you're welcome to go man i, uh, I appreciate it's a little you carving out time out now but thanks yeah right on all right y'all have a good night peace Thank you for watching this clip from Grand Theft World. You can find us on GrandTheftWorld.com. You can also see us every Sunday night, 9 p.m., streaming live on Rockfin.com forward slash Richard Grove. You can create a free account. You can see the live stream because YouTube's banning it and uh, we're moving elsewhere. So we'll continue to put clips here on YouTube. Thank you again for taking time to sample it. But what we want you to do is see the whole episode. You know, you've got 168 hours in a week. It's not unreasonable to take five hours strategically to invest in understanding what's going on in the world, catch up on some contextual history, and we have some fun along the way. Also, if you go to GrandTheftWorld.com, we have a community feature there. You can sign up. You get a weekly briefing, a rundown of all the things we found valuable during the week, maybe some things that got censored and moved to other platforms. You'll get relinked re up to that, a whole bunch of other benefits that come with subscription. And if that's too much for you, just go to GrandTheftWorld.com and download the 2040 Strategic Trends document. It's a summary of what the British Ministry of Defense uh, has planned for everyone's families going in the future. So become aware of the plans that exist. Also, fortify your knowledge with uh, things that are substantial and meaningful and help you understand so you can make better decisions. That's the purpose of the Grand Theft World podcast, and we'll see you in the next clip. Thank you.